Yeah, come on, Two Rivers Church. Can you greet everybody joining us online? Everybody at all of our locations in Binghamton, Cortland, Corning, and Ithaca. We are so glad to be with you right now. My name is Will. I'm the lead pastor here. And I want you to know that I love you. I care for you. I am praying for you. And I'm believing God's best for you in this series. We are in week number two of a series entitled Stress Out. Everybody say stress out. Come on, let's say it like you want it out of your life. Stress out. Almost. All right, we're going we're gonna to get into this. Our culture right now, in our culture, suicide rates are up. Depression rates are up just in general overall. In fact, we are going into a season of the year where we'll have seasonal affective disorder. We're going to have an, an uptick in what is already up, depression and all of those things. And what we want to do in this series is we want to have the stress removed out of our lives. And, and we're participating, though, in a culture in a way that our culture is putting stress in our lives. That what we are doing in the way we function and how we live, the stress is getting in, not out. And I don't think I have to convince too many people that there is a problem of stress that we're functioning in. What our problem is, most of us, how many people would say, I'd like less stress in my life? Just put your hands up, hands up everywhere. Everybody wants less stress. Here's our problem. We don't know how to live differently than what we're living. And, and in fact, the American Psychological Association did actually lists out the greatest stressors in our lives. And, and it comes this way. It, it goes in our schedule in our finances, in our relationships, in our work. So in this series, guess what we're gonna do? Last week, we talked about our schedule. If you wanna find that, you can go to tworivers.church and just click watch past messages. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can get all of those and you can stay up to date as to what's going on. But this week, we're gonna talk about finances. Because there's stress in all of these areas, and it's robbing us of our peace and our joy. And Jesus has a better way if you'll allow him to be the Lord of your life. So today we're talking about financial stress. I want to make sure everybody has notes at every single location. I'm going to have the ushers come just right up to the front of the room at every location. If you didn't get notes, just slip your hand up in the air, and the usher is going to make sure that you get note paper so you can file along with this message. So this is not a giving message. We're not going to raise any money today. Can I get a good Amen. Amen. That's a, you, now later on, you're going to wish you didn't say amen. But this message is not for me. This message is for you. Because we are under financial stress. I've become convinced a long time ago that I need to help people figure out how to get out from under the financial burdens of life. Because people aren't stingy. People are strapped. And generosity, like I don't have to convince Christians to become generous. Generosity is in the heart of a Christian. When you give your life to Jesus, you automatically want to give the way he gives. I don't have to tell you to do that. What we have to tell people how to figure out how to do is to get out from under the weight in the crushing burden of debt. And so I don't want to ask you to give something when you can't give. I, I want to help you today to get out of the financial black hole that you're in. So turn with me. This is our series verse. We're camping out around Luke chapter 21, verse 34. This is, this is the verse that, that the whole series is based off of. It says, this is Jesus. He's talking about the end times. And he's saying in the end times, things are going to get worse. There's going to be trial and there's going to be tri tribulation and, and there's going to be things that are happening all around you. And he says, as these things are happening now, be careful or your hearts are going to be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, 
in the anxieties of life. And that day is going to close in on you suddenly like a trap. What Jesus is saying is that as the end times are approaching, when the day is coming closer and closer, one of the challenges that we have as believers is that our hearts can get weighed down. That actually the stress that is around us gets in us. And if we're not careful, we lose the thing that God put to birth in us that we are a part of the kingdom of God there should be righteousness peace and joy through the Holy Spirit in our lives and what we have to be careful of is that there's a culture around us there is an end times sequence that's designed to begin to weigh down our hearts and God doesn't want us to be weighed down he wants us to get the stress out of our lives and so today we're going to talk about This trap, this day is going to close in like a trap, and it's really talking about the day of the Lord, that 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 day is going to come, and and if your hearts are weighed down, you're going to get stuck. I used to be terrified of that, that the rapture would happen. If you don't know what the rapture is, there's a day coming when Jesus is going to return, and everybody who is a believer and has put their trust in Jesus Christ is going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. So growing up as a kid, I was terrified of that concept. I was like, I'm certain I'm going to be left behind. I sinned. I know I did. Jesus is going to leave me behind. But Jesus does give us this warning. He does say to be careful that our hearts don't be weighed down. That's the opposite of us rising up. And so here's how did we get into this place of financial stress that's the question I want to answer and the good news is the Bible's very very vocal on this subject because there's more verses in the Bible about possessions and money than about heaven and hell combined in fact there's 2,500 verses there's 16 parables that have to do with possessions and money now I want to go to one of the parables that actually doesn't it isn't directly about possessions and money, but it mentions possessions and money. So turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 15. Just in case you didn't know it, we are a Luke chapter 15 kind of church. Luke chapter 15 is all about lost things. It's a story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and then the the prodigal son, which really is the lost son. The father says about his son, the son that was dead and now is alive again. And so what we discover is that God is interested in lost things. And so as a church, we've just said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna be about what Jesus is about, amen? We wanna go after the things that Jesus goes after and Jesus left the 99 to go find the one. And, I, and I'll tell you, we got to fight that as a church. Don't ever get more about the 99 than you are the one because you're no longer pursuing the heart of Jesus. If you don't have to sometimes turn your back on what other Christians might think about you, God forbid that sister so-and-so might think that you're not holy enough because you went into a place to reach somebody and got a little bit dirty. That's where the heart of Jesus is. And if you don't ever have to turn your back on a Christian from time to time to go find a lost person, then I suggest that maybe we're not doing it the right way. So here's what we got. In in Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. In verse 12, the younger one said to his father, and this right here, see this word younger? I might just suggest this, the financial trouble and financial difficulties may not be as big of an issue for the older folks. In fact, they've lived a lot longer and they've made some more mistakes and they've got a little more wisdom in this area of their life. Doesn't mean that we can't learn. But I'll tell you, I've made a lot more financial mistakes when I was younger. And then you decide, okay, I do want to eat or I do want to live in a house or I do want to, I better handle my finances a little bit better. 
But this is a message, so if you're a high school or a college age, young married couple, young adult, I want you to lean in. And then, and then what happens is the younger one says to his father, Father, give me. Everyone say, give me. Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, what's interesting is the younger son is saying, look, I, I know I'm getting an inheritance when you die, Dad, but I want it now. I want it right now. I want what this is. And so I'm going to give you on your notes, you've got some things. We're just going to use the, the prodigal son here. This is the son who asked for all of the inheritance now. He said, it, it's, what's happened here is how do we know that we're stressed out? Number one, when we're consumed with having more. He wanted it all now. He wanted, he wanted the more today. And when you're consumed with having more, when you don't just want some, I want the more, you're going to invite stress into your life. Ecclesiastes, we learned last week, it says it's better to have one handful with tranquility than two with trouble. That there's this idea that I might be better off not having as much as I think I want. That, that potentially, and I know you got to hear me out on this, America. Don't stone me yet. Capitalism, don't come kill me. Because the Bible has some things to say that are countercultural. We've been surrounded by a culture that says, go get it all. That's the American dream. Pursue all of these things because if you get this face wash, you're going to have less, whatever, you, zits. You'll be more beautiful. You'll get a better husband. You'll have a better life. And so just for 12 easy payments of $43.99, you can have everything you have ever desired. And, and I, I, as I, I know for me, I, I mean, I, I learned about budgeting as a kid. My parents taught me well. Like as a kid, they gave me an allowance. They gave me, uh, we would go on vacation. They would give me a, a set amount of money. So when it was time to pay for everything, my parents would pay. When everybody was getting it, they would pay for all that. But when we stop at the gro at like the gas station, I could blow all of my money at the gas station, or I could wait and use that later on. I was learning about budgeting at a young age. But when my wife and I got married, young couple, double income, no kids. I was making a lot of money. She was a teacher. She was doing all right. And so we, we, we were like pulling in money. We went out to eat every weekend, every, forget every weekend, just about every day. I went out to eat for lunch, then out to eat for dinner. We spent money, we traveled, we'd go to hotels, we'd go all over the place. And at the end of the day, when we looked at, we looked back at our time while we were running around and we've got nothing to show for it. We didn't build up anything. We, we didn't, it was all just, just money. We had access to money, but we made it all disappear because we wanted more and we wanted it now. And, and so it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So you can just write this down. Number two, we're stressed out when we want everything now. Everybody say now. now. If you're in college, you're getting ready to go into college, maybe you're in high school, teenagers, you're going to show up and you've got this dream about getting out of the house. You're going to show up at a college university when COVID's all done and they allow you back on campus What's going to happen is they're going to have a bunch of tables at your registration line. And all the credit card companies are going to be lined up telling you how they're going to give you this great credit card. All you do is sign your name here, give them your social security number, and the next thing you know, 
If you're not careful, you're going to be consumed with everything right now. Because credit gives you access to, like, I'm going I'm to get today what I'll pay for tomorrow. Sounds like Popeye, right? I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. And so young marrieds, Crystal and I, we did this. We, we wanted in year one the type of house my parents had in year 30 because we wanted it now. And we were willing to put ourselves into debt. We were willing to leverage ourselves in a way because we want it now. And I know we got an Instagram culture. You, you know, young couples, you're, you're like, I got to be able to take a picture of my house with the pillows. And the pillows all got to look so. And, and, and so, Pastor, I know you're just, you're not from our generation. You don't really understand. So get a smaller house. Don't have it all. Just decorate one corner. That's your Instagram corner. <laughs> but hear me on this. You don't need to have everything right now. Verse 13, and and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Number three, when we're stressed out, when we engage in self-destructive behavior, there is something in the human heart that we want to squander our wealth in wild living. All the addicts know all about this. And you give, give me a dollar, let me see what happens to it. Like, don't, don't give an addict money, say goodbye, right? But it's not just addicts. This is all of us. This is everybody. We got, we got something in our heart. Like, Americans today, we squander $240 billion a year in gambling alone. Like, you know you're not going to win money when you go gamble. It's the, the, they, they don't build 200 billion dollar casinos because they're losing money to you right that's not how that works we squander the money every time I go to help somebody with their finances I'll sit down we look at how they handle their money and what they're doing with it it's easy to see how somebody else squanders their money it's not as easy to see how I squander my money Right? It's not as easy to see it like, oh, you just need to stop going to Dunkin' Donuts every morning. I shouldn't say that. That's probably okay. You shouldn't go to Starbucks. Come on, everybody. Praise the Lord. We don't believe in that Starbucks up in here. And so we are Dunkin' Donuts Church. You, you belong here except for if you go to Starbucks. And so... So we got to just search our heart. We, so here's what happens, though. Don't we do this? We go, we go out to eat. My wife and I would go out to eat, and we realized when we moved to Binghamton that we went out to eat all the time. We got here. We were on church planner salary. We were like, we can't go out to eat anymore. And what we figured out was we were spending at least three times more going out to eat than we did when we were staying at home. We are just wasting money. And now they've got an app where if you hit the button on the app, they just show up at your door and you can pay four times as much for that food. But it was easy. And we squander our money. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, everybody say spent everything. There was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So this is what I want you to write down. We, we are stressed out when we spend everything. We're stressed out when we spend everything. The average American has nearly $17,000 in credit card debt. Like we didn't didn't just spend up to what we have, we spend way more than what we have. Because there's a day, I've got this job and I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get a raise in a couple of months. And I've got this other thing. I got a side hustle that I'm I'm bringing in some extra cash, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be a payday coming out. I'm convinced I'm going to get that bonus, so I'm going to spend it now. And this is what happens: there's bad days coming. He spent everything, and then a famine hit. And the Bible says that the famine hits 
And it it happens to the righteous and the unrighteous. That bad days come for everybody. There's circumstantial bad days and then there's spiritual bad days. In fact, we're in the month of October now and, and I want to invite you to come out to prayer one on Sunday mornings. Because I'm we're going to start teaching about spiritual warfare in prayer one. Because spiritual warfare in the month of October just begins to ratchet up. If you haven't noticed it in your life already, that as we get into this month, there's something about the month of October that there's just, we gotta, I, got, I want you to know how to stand. The Bible says when you've done all you can to stand your ground. And so we'll talk about that in prayer one, and, and you can show up and you can find the times for that at every location on Sunday morning. But it says in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, when he came to his senses, and that's my prayer for us today, that we would come to our senses with, with our finances. We would come to our senses around how our culture has created an environment that creates financial stress. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And so I want us to take a moment and I, and I want us to understand, I want you to just think about this, church. How many of us, when you look at your life and you, you go back and you think through this, you say, look, I, I resonate with all of those things. Like I'm consumed with wanting more and I want it now. And, 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 I'm, and I squander in self-destructive behavior my money. And then, and then what happens is I spend everything. Like how many of us, that's, that's like how many of us are in that spot? I'm under financial stress and I'm in, I'm in that spot. Don't lie, shun the devil, right? And here's what's really interesting. This is the sobering thought because that is the description of the prodigal son. How many of us would proclaim to be Christian that I'm a follower of Jesus, but the description that my life matches up to is the one that's running from God. And so I want you to turn now with me to, in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter nine, verse six. And this is a verse that is proclaimed about Jesus. We oftentimes will hear it around Christmas time. It says, for us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And then everybody, what are the last three words? Everybody together, one, two, three. Prince of Peace. I want you to understand what this Prince of Peace actually means. The Hebrew word for prince is sar. S-A-R, it means Lord or Chief or General. This is not like a prince from a Disney fairy tale where he shows up and he sings some songs. This is the prince, and and this is the, the thing I want you to understand. When we say Prince of Peace, we're talking about the one who is in charge. And what, what needs to happen is, is Sar means the one in charge. It's the word Lord. In fact, that word Lord is used 7,800 times in the Bible. And I want you to understand this and contrast this because the word Savior is only used 36 times. See, everyone wants a Savior, few people want a Lord. You don't really need a savior, somebody to rescue me. I need a Lord in my life. Somebody who's going to tell me how to do it his way. Somebody who's going to tell me this is how to function in in, in an America. What we want is the savior, but we are, I did it my way. We're singing the anthem of Satanism. We're singing the anthem of self-actualization. I don't follow everybody, anybody, I do it the way I want to do it. And we wonder why we're filled with stress. 
We wonder why we're under financial stress, why we don't have peace in our lives. Because the Lord says, this is how you do it. And those who follow the Lord say, Lord, I will do it the way you tell me to do it. And if you'll follow the Tsar, the Prince, the Lord, then you get the Shalom, the rest and the tranquility, the wholeness, the completeness and the contentment. See, we're so confused by our culture We've been following our culture and how our culture says to handle finances. And then we get upset with the church when they talk about money because I'm under stress. I'm under a heavy load. My heart's been weighed down with this burden. But I want you to hear this, church. There's a Sar Shalom. There's a Prince of Peace that wants to lift that heavy burden off of your life right now. That there is a Lord who wants to come and he wants to give you peace in this area of your life. And so I want to, there is no peace apart from God's way. And and so I'm going to give you really quickly, I'm going to have the team come back. I'm going to give you very quickly some of the principles of peace. That the prince of peace has some principles for our life. And there's a connection between peace and lordship. Psalm chapter four, verse eight says it this way, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Psalm 29, or Romans chapter five, verse one, it says, therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All through scripture, when you see peace, you find a Lord. And it's very possible today that we have never allowed the lordship of Jesus Christ into our finances. You do it your way, you have no peace. You do it the Lord's way, there's peace. If you go God's way, there's peace that goes with it. The Prince of Peace has these principles. So I want you to write this down. Number one, obedience. This is the principle of financial peace is obedience. Malachi chapter three, verses seven through 12, it says, ever since the time of our ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees. What are those? Those are his laws. That's the print. That's the Lord saying, this is how to live. And you've not kept them. And what does God say? He says, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. What's the prodigal done? The prodigal has run from God. And and in Malachi, it says, but you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And God says, in tithes and in offerings. The tithe is the 10%. The offering is above and beyond that. In verse 9, it says, you're under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. What is the storehouse? That's the church. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this. God says, look, obey me. Obey me because I'm going to bless you when you do, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I'm not going to throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there's not going to be enough room to store it. That sounds good. That sounds real good. But it starts with an act of faith, an act of obedience. And then it says in verse 11, I'm going to prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. The first principle is to obedience. The second principle of financial peace is contentment. Contentment. How do we stay content? I want you to just write this down next to that. Gratitude. Gratitude. God, I can't believe you picked me. God, I'll walk away from all of this because I only want you. I don't need anything you give me. You've already given me enough. Contentment might be easier for older people because they got a framework or a mindset that says nobody owes me anything. 
We got a generation coming up that believes somebody owes us something. Somebody, I didn't get what you got, so I mold that. I mold the thing that you have. Here's what Timothy says, for, or Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with what? Godliness with? Come on, let's do that again. Godliness with? Contentment is great gain. Everybody wants to know godliness. I want all the stuff. That's how I get great gain. And God says, it's totally reversed. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. You're, nothing's coming out of this life. We're too temporary. We gotta think eternal. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content. That's that word again. We'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich, come on, they fall into temptation and a trap. We've heard that a few times now. And into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And we got Americans, we've been told, get rich, get rich, get rich, get rich, get everything, get it all. And the Bible says clearly, I'm going to slap your hand. You're trying to get your hands in the cookie jar. I could do it though. I'm, I'm not like everybody else. I got this God. And it's look, it's, I'm telling you right now, it's the word of God. It's not my opinion as your pastor. This is God's opinion. And it's not an opinion. It's the Lord's command. It, you, you plunge into ruin and destruction. And so for the love of money, so what happens our heart, the Bible says that by, the money is wicked, it's deceitful, it'll deceive you. You think you're not chasing after money, next thing you know, you, you're just, you chased after money. It's the, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. We didn't even know it. The description of the soil that gets choked out, the cares of this life, the worries of this world, and the deceitfulness of wealth, it chokes out the fruitfulness of the gospel. And so this is what it says in Proverbs chapter 30, verses eight and nine. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Has anybody heard that? Jesus' prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. And that's what it says in Proverbs. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you. See that when we get all that money, we don't need God anymore. I put my trust in my own strength. I earned all of this. I don't need to give any of this to God. God didn't do anything for me. I did it off the sweat of my own brow. Or I might become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Contentment. Number three is margin. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. And they didn't leave any space. They spend everything. They spend it well beyond what we ought to. Margin brings peace. Let me, let me explain this in a different way because you'll probably understand it better. If you know it's gonna take you 15 minutes to get from your house to work and you leave exactly at 15 minutes, when that person in front of you is driving very slow, what do you wanna do? I'm gonna cuss them out. Get out of my way, I got stress now. I got stress. How many people you get that stress? Because you, you didn't leave the house early enough, so now you got to drive too fast to get and you do all of that. That's what happens. That's called margin. You didn't, you didn't leave enough space. You didn't leave enough room. So what happened was now I got stress. Now I got this stress in my life. And this is what happens to us financially. We spend, we spend beyond our means. And so margin creates... Peace, it brings peace into our life. And I'll just tell you this Christmas, we got a tendency to overspend at Christmas time. We're gonna make Christmas good. We're gonna make it the best Christmas ever. 
And I'll tell you, I don't remember many Christmas presents from being a ch- when I was a kid. I don't. I remember a few. But you know what I remember the most out of all my Christmases? There was a year we didn't get any presents. My parents took us to New York City. We went to Radio City Music Hall. We saw the, the Christmas extravaganza. And we spent that time together as a family. It's one of the best Christmas memories of my life. And, and we'll go overboard trying to spend and get more stuff and acquire more things. And, and I want you to know margin creates peace. It's just a principle of the Prince of Peace. And, and, and so what if we had a simple Christmas this year? And in the words of Buddy the Elf, I thought maybe we could make gingerbread houses and eat cookie dough and go ice skating and maybe even hold hands. Like what if our Christmas this year was a little different? We've got time. Hopefully you didn't go all crazy on that just yet. You got time to make it a great Christmas. Number four is generosity. Psalm 112 verse five says, good will come to those who are generous and lend freely. If you don't have margin, you can't be generous. And it says in Proverbs chapter 11 verse 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Generosity leads to peace. It's not an act. This is not something I did one time. It's, it's a character quality. It's not what we do, it's who we are. I'm a generous person, you are a generous person. God is a generous God. And so what happens when a generous person walks into a room, a generous person, I'm not talking about the offering plate going by on Sunday. I'm talking about when you're generous and you see somebody in need, you help them. That's generosity. And so every believer, hear me on this, if you just heard that and you thought, oh gosh, there's no one in this church given to me, stop being selfish. Like stop being selfish. Like you got need, I get that, but your heart is at stake. And so principles of financial peace, number five is integrity. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, for we're taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but in the eyes of men. And then number six is dependence. Until now, look at this, John chapter 16, it's a, Jesus said, until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. In other words, you're trying to do this all on your own. You're trying to do this in your way, and God wants to do it his way. We gotta depend on him, and he says this, ask and you're gonna receive, and your joy is gonna be complete. When we depend on him, what happens is we invite the Prince of Peace into our life, the Shar Shalom. Luke chapter 15, I wanna wrap up that chapter real quick. It says in verse 18, the prodigal, He said, I'm gonna set out and I'm gonna go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. You know what happened? His father, when his father saw him far off, he said, how dare you come back here? You squandered everything, you screwed it all up. That's not what the father did. The father stood up, he's watching from far off and he ran to meet him. And he put his arms around him and he gladly welcomed him home. And he said, let's throw a party. I'm gonna kill the fatted calf because my son was dead, but now he's alive again. You need, to, you need to know that there's hope in your financial burdens. You need to know that there's hope that the Lord can give you peace. That when, when we realize and recognize, hey, I've been doing things the wrong way, what the prodigal son did was he turned around and he went and he ran back home. And that's what God wants to do. That's what I want us to be able to do right now. I want you to be able to run to the Father today. 
I want to pray a prayer of blessing over your life, and then we're going to respond at every single location and online. And I believe that God is calling us back, that there is somewhere in us the need to repent and the need to lean into God's way. And, and when God's way comes, we'll have peace in this area of life. And I want that peace. I want that for you. So just bow your heads with me. Jesus, I pray now for every single person that your peace would begin to break the stronghold of financial stress. That we could run now to the Father. Your promise is that you would take care of all of our needs according to your riches and glory. That it is through Christ Jesus that we have provision, that we have all that we need. You are Jehovah Jireh, and I declare that over every heart and every life, that break the power of lack, break the power of iniquity. Jesus, I ask you to break now the stronghold of generational curses, that there is a lack spirit on people, there's a not enough spirit on people, that you would give us a spirit of generosity, that you would give us a spirit of enough, that you would give us a spirit of abundance, that you would put favor around us, that in this area of our lives, the stress would get out and that you would come in. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen.